<laughs> let's start off where it's really in retrograde, and that is in foreign policy. Uh, I know we're kind of been consumed. Uh, there is an election coming up here in the United States. There's been the protest uh, about George Floyd's uh, death. Um, so, yeah. you know, there's been a lot of things going on, but we sometimes forget and what's going on around the world. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of times when we talk about police brutality, some of us, uh, you know, in the honor of the great Fred Hampton, talk about we tied into imperialism. Mm-hmm. So we're always looking on this show, you know, we're foreign policy junkies. So we're always talking to people like Mark Sloboda uh, and across uh, the, the board. Um, and something's going down, fam. Yesterday, uh, China, China got into it with India. Okay. Um, this is something that's a little that needs to be paid attention to, fam, because there's a lot of implications. What does this mean for the United well, States? World War Three was trending. Yes, yesterday. it was again. Like yes. we've been in the at the brink of war in the last year, like often, too yes. often. Yes. All right. Well, let's go to the let's go to the tape here. In an event that the Chinese experts call the most severe situation China and India have experienced along the border in decades, a fatal a physical clash broke out Monday between the two countries border defense troops in the Galwan Valley. Now, the Galwan Valley is kind of near the Kashmir area, the north, uh, mm-hmm. the northeastern part of it, bordering on China. Uh, and, it, you know, this is something we had to look for. There was these uncontrolled areas of Kashmir. Uh, there was always been a dispute about who owns this strategic area. There's a river that runs through it that leads out. Uh, so there's water there involved. There's uh, strategic resources. Uh, there's military uh, uh, reasons why they want to have this area. And yesterday, 30 people, 30 soldiers were de- were killed, mm-hmm. uh, Indian soldiers, and including a colonel, fam. So what does this mean? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> it does make me, and I, and I put it right here, in the 1962 war, the Galwan, the Galwan Valley, which is the area that was in dispute, was a flashpoint. Why China is now claiming sovereignty over it. Uh, and it says the first time since 1975, casualties were reported along the Sino-Indian border as 20 Indian Army personnel, including a colonel, were killed in a clash with Chinese troops in the Galwan Valley in eastern Lakta. Uh, this is the biggest military confrontation in over five decades and has significantly escalated the already vi- uh, vi- say that word for me volatile, volatile. border standoff in the region. Um, so yes, fam. But there's this is really making me because I'm always looking. <clears throat> what's the United States' next move, right? Mm-hmm. Donald Trump has been uber aggressive with the Chinese. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt that uh, Donald Which, Trump and a lot of our Congress feels yeah. that China is the next geopolitical yeah. Uh, yeah. enemy that we have to confront. Right. right? Yeah, it's the new Cold War. It is. Yeah. By by far, you know, we had the the talks of the trade deal, whatnot, and even if you think that that our trade deal sucked from NAFTA with China, whatnot. And, and Trump was just trying to rearrange it. No, right. he's played serious hardball with the Chinese. In fact, in Huawei, he had in, in Canada one of the CFOs detained there for a month. Yep. And stuff's been going on about that. They've been talking that Chinese has been uh, kind of claiming that the CIA and the State Department was behind all the acts of detaining this woman. Mm-hmm. So this is really getting serious. Now, why I think the United States, and we have to pay attention to this, is, is that Donald Trump has had this kind of like love relationship with Narendra Modi. Mm-hmm. You know, we understand that, you know, when he's courting Modi, he's courting that kind of conservative yeah. uh, Indian uh, a vote, the Hindu vote here in the United States, which right. tend to be a little bit more conservative. And they showed up from Narendra Modi. We see him out there with Cruz and whatnot because he's courting that vote. Mm-hmm. But also when it comes to the Kashmir situation, um, we have over here. Now, I just got a little clip of Donald Trump talking about Narendra Modi on YouTube. It's a small one, John. If you can put that up real quick. I just want to kind of show the relationship they have between each other. Well, we can have a trade deal with India, but I'm really saving the big deal for later on. We're doing a very big trade deal with India. We'll have it. I don't know if it'll be done before the election, but we'll have a very big deal with India. Uh, we're not treated very well by India, but I happen to like Prime Minister Modi a lot. And he told me we'll have 7 million people between the airport and the, and the event. And the stadium, I understand, is sort of semi under construction, but it's going to be the largest stadium in the world. So it's going to be very exciting. But he says, you know, so you can see that whole uh, relationship building. He goes, I like Narendra Modi a lot. You know, he's always playing the big negotiator saying, when I traded fair by India, yeah. you know, they've had a little jostling here and there. But for the most part, Trump has had this relationship with India. And it really showed when we had the Kashmir situation, mm-hmm. when, you know, uh, 
Modi sent his troops on in. Uh, Trump says India and Pakistan can handle the Kashmir dispute on on their own. You know, which he kind of signaled to a lot of libertarian votes, like, we're yeah. not going to get involved. But, but then, it was really a signal for, go ahead, Modi. Go do what right. you got to do. Because you know, he knew that Pakistan's not going to stand up to India when it came to that situation. Right. So. But then also, and also, like, this, I feel like that was the right call. But uh, then at the same time, his aggressiveness towards China has lost him a lot of those, um, you know, anti-war people who have, feel like he's being extremely aggressive with China. And who was he? He campaigned on being a non-interventionist, and it just seems like he agrees with with the the neoliberals and the neocons on on pursuing more of a combative approach to China. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talks. Uh, you know, I was having a little dispute with a friend of mine yesterday, we were talking about China, and he was saying that China's kind of infiltrated themselves in the Congress. I said, uh, he, meaning <laughs> lobbyist wise, to get right. them favorable deals. And I, I listen when it comes to the NAFTA free trade agreement, it comes to our relationship with China. I never held China accountable for what they did to the United States. No, it was the elites. It was the oligarchs. It was all these the one percent going over to China and getting cheap labor mm-hmm. and taking advantage of it. Right. I hold them accountable. Our Congress, those people, whatnot. You know, I, I don't hold China accountable. And it's kind of ridiculous when you start blaming China for what happened with the United States taking advantage of that cheap labor and just killing manufacturing in the United States. Uh, so, I mean, it's kind of weird to see a lot of people just being so anti-China now, but uh, it kind of fits the bill. I even feel with the COVID-19, a lot of the yeah. Congress members were pointing the finger to China. Look what yeah. they did. Look what they did. So you got this rhetoric and this kind of narrative right. That China, it came from a disgusting village in Wuhan, right. is what a congressman said on the floor from Florida, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah. So, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm looking, when's the next move for imperialism? Because I can see, you know, another dispute going on and Donald Trump going in there and saying, we'll help you out, Modi, whatnot, just to kind of go at China. Yeah. You know, where we're moving ships into the South China Sea. Uh, this is something we have to pay attention to, fam. Well, imperialism, where are we going next? What are we doing next? Uh, uh, but China's got us beat in that case. I mean, I think the United States is at a very vulnerable place right now. We we have begun to see the economic collapse because it's just starting. Like, it didn't just start with coronavirus. You're going to see businesses try to open back up, and then you're going to see them close down because they're not going to be able to maintain because people are still not going out, like, whether it's retail, whether it's um, restaurants, the volume isn't the same. People aren't making those same numbers. You have to think about it like in terms of, you know, what the resources are spending, the cost of rent yeah. and, 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 and how little help they're getting from the government. And so I think we're going to start seeing the U.S. economic collapse and the U.S. be at a very vulnerable position. And China has a really, really wonderful middle class. I mean, their middle class is strong. Yeah, the the middle out. class is coming here and they're, the, the kids are studying here. And then they're going back home and opening their new businesses with a degree from an American university. I mean, they have homes. They have everything we don't have. And as authoritarian as China can be, we have to look within and see how authoritarian we are ourselves. Yet, at the same time, we're not helping our people out of poverty. Yeah. So, And we talk about the geopolitics yeah. of it all. When's the last time China's invaded them anywhere? You know what I'm saying? Right. This, I know we hear about this confrontation. It's... It's not the norm for China. They don't they don't go around having military conflicts around the world. You know what I'm saying? We have Mark Sloboda on. We talked about it. You know, uh, some people like that we know like to mention what what what's the uh, the the Buddhist monks over there? Uh, in uh, you're talking about the, U- the in 1970s they invaded it. Um, people talk about it. The country. Uh, Jesus, not, not Tibet. The, Tibet. Tibet. Okay. Refers oh, the to Tibet. Tibet. Yeah, Before yeah, yeah. I was born, <laughs> and I'm old. That's what. That's the last time they had a serious <laughs> military conflict over there. A little with Vietnam. A little something going on. Like there was a. But it's the, look at their actions as a country, and the and you know the Belt and Silk Initiative mm-hmm. Road that they're yeah. building, which is going to pull more people out of poverty. You know. So I mean, I mean, um, nobody's saying China is like innocent, but what 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 we are saying is like we vilify them to an extent without understanding that we have done far worse in some cases. You yeah. know, that there's good and bad, and it, it's another superpower. Again, it's just another major superpower, but we are the imperialists invading yeah. as many countries as possible. And it seems that when we have these talks, though, you know, uh, in Congress, when they start pointing mm-hmm. the finger at China, they're trying to manufacture consent of course, to, yeah. you know, be more aggressive yeah. military-wise, Always. like in the South China Sea and whatnot. And this could be another little loophole. Oh, this could be a way that goes, 
you know, Donald Trump saying, we can get at China. Let's help out Modi. You know what I'm saying? Let's do something. Let's, uh, let's, inf- let's, let's, you know, cause another uh, catastrophe or something to go on to use an excuse to manufacture consent to get in there. Um, I also put up real quick, and I, you know, I was kind of trying to look up what's going on, look at the history. In the moon of Alabama over here, um, June 16th, Johnny, right there, you're going to see that Belarus has a U.S.-sponsored color revolution underway. Now, uh, it's kind of interesting. A lot of people talk about this gentleman over here who's the ruler of, uh, make, make it bigger here, uh, Lukashenko. He's the, uh, they call him the last authoritarian, the last dictator of Europe is what they kind of refer to him uh, a lot. He's been in power for over 25 years. Um, They've always had ties, Belarus, a lot of close ties when it comes to energy with Russia. Mm -hmm. And Russia goes, gives Belarus a lot of the energy at a good price. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's been some, you know, some, it's almost like another Ukraine situation that went on. And in fact, Lukashenko uh, kind of supported all the uh, opposition, the Western led regime change. He provided uh, weapons and stuff. To, to the whole regime change. Um, and it's kind of weird, the whole situation, what's going on, because a couple months ago, Pompeo was out there trying to stri- strike a deal with Lukashenko. But it seems like Lukashenko is very reliant on Russia. Mm-hmm. They're going to stay stay with Russia. So therefore, since we couldn't get them to, to break, here it comes again. Now, now we're going to sponsor yeah. another regime change. And it says, U.S. engineered attempts to overthrow a foreign government by stirring civil arrest are usually named after a color or at times a flower. You know, the Orange Revolution, it talks yeah. about it. The Rose Revolution in Georgia. The Green Movement in Iran. Um, but now the CIA and its assortment of supporting organizations seem to have run out of color choices. How else can they explain their latest attempt in Belarus called the Slipper Revolution? <laughs> no, The Guardian, which published the Slipper Revolution headline today, but letter changed it, did not come up with that stupid moniker itself. The U.S. Department funded... Belarus EU TV station was the first to mention Slipper in its picture caption on May 31st. So the problem is the problem with the U.S. involving themselves in relations with Russia and and China and trying to 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 come between and and to vilify and start regime change is we we don't have like the actual physical like closeness that they have. Like it is so it's so difficult for us to get over there like it's just it's just gonna it's 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 our war to lose it would be our war to lose I oh think. my god I, it's um we got to get mark sloboda back on because i know he's gonna have a lot to say about yeah, this this is the, once sure. again here we go again a little ukraine situation taking taking hold in belarus which is right next to russia mm-hmm. it's in uh i would say eastern eastern europe way way i mean yeah. you know it's 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 there it's it, it's probably part of asia I would. I should learn. It's that. just not convenient for them no. to not be with Russia. They they're just proximity wise. It's yeah. just beneficial for them. Like we 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 have no business. Yeah, and, in that. And, and I mean, like, it's just we have a friend, Art Artissimo, you know, and uh, <laughs> he's from Belarus. And Bel- Belarus, them is, is once again, it's like Ukraine has a lot of Russian yeah. culture. A lot of people are loyal to Russia. Uh, you know, and it's just weird things that take place because here, the, here once again, this guy who was the leader of Belarus was kind of supportive. And, and was against the whole Crimea annexation. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So he was supportive of the West doing what they did in the Ukraine. But now he's kind of digressed in the same type of position that the Ukrainian uh, uh, government had to go to. And uh, it looks like the United States is not having it. They no. guess they want him out now because yeah. they want power. They want to go out Russia and they want to sack Russia as much yeah, as they can. Of course. You know, American elitist and whatnot. So once again, here they are wiggling their, their toe in there. We got to pay attention to the situation. We got to talk to Mark Sloboda because it's gonna shit's gonna go down in Belarus, fam. Just just Damn. watch. Um, also, right now, South Korea troops. Oh my God, are we? Are, Mercury is in retrograde, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we talked about this. South Korean troops and tanks amassed on the border of North Korea after embassy attack. Fam, what do you Damn. got over here? Johnny, did you put that in, or fam, did you put that in? Not me. Oh, I didn't put it in. Um. South Korea has stationed tanks on the board uh, on the board with Nord it says on the board with North Korea and promised a strong reaction after embassy building set up to foster better relations between the na- neighbors was blown up. So once again this is like an embassy building that was put there for North mm-hmm. and South Korea to have relationships and yet they blew it up. And and, and it, I'm really having a hard time understanding what's going on with North and South Korea. I want to know what Moon Jae-in's power is. 
because he's the one who pushed for these peace talks. And if South Korea is acting up this way, why? You know, what's the implications behind mm-hmm. it? I know that North Korea and Kim Jong-un months ago was really pissed off that South Korea didn't want to stop their American-led drills. Mm-hmm. In other words, we spend uh, millions and millions of dollars, our government, uh, out of our tax dollars, once again, to fund these drills. And when they do these drills, it's always an emulation of how they're going to attack, right. how they're going to invade. So it's another way of saying, look what I'm doing over here. This is what we'll do to you if you get out of line. So Kim Jong-un was really mad that they weren't stopping these drills. Now you have a situation like this. I'm just trying to understand the gist of everything because I understand that North Korea is still very upset. They're mm-hmm. upset with the sanctions. Nothing has changed. Nothing has been lifted. He feel, uh, you know, They feel like Donald Trump just used the whole situation as a photo op. And this is something we praise this Donald is, Trump for, right? Well, this, I mean, I don't, I didn't, we didn't so much as praise him as say this is a good move. And yes. the Democrats, uh, establishment Democrats, were attacking him for it saying that it was a photo op and he's he's proving them right he's proving them right by by you know north korea's response to it so yeah i is there any way that south korea might be being influenced by well by people who do want this conflict i'm sure there are i feel feel like we talk about south korea they're just so like littered with like this colonial imperialism just Mm -hmm. set inside their roots of their old culture they're you know fascinated by pop music and there's so much these young girls doing plastic it's very pro-capitalist right now it's to a point where it's it's almost like worse than our culture i mean not not that our culture isn't in that but i think they've taken like the worst parts of american imperialism and capitalism and like implemented it so i'm thinking that they want nothing to do with what north korea is would is offering because north korea is so much more controlled and anti well they're just anti-capitalist that you know what i'm saying south korea let in the capitalists they let in the west and north korea right. did not north korea blew up this building because they want you know and then here comes the south korean tanks they come amassing in right. you know what i'm saying and so now it's like now they're at attentions again uh, in the DM, DMZ zone, you know what I'm saying? But a lot of people feel that North Korea is kind of blowing it up. Like, North Korea just wants help. They want mm-hmm. medicine. They want food. So they're not getting the attention. So, I mean, I don't know if South Korea really is the one to really kind of blame here for just no, holding think, their ways yeah. and stuff. And I, once again, I like Moon Jae-in. We've talked about this before. A lot of people are always talking about Trump and, and King Jong-un. And it's like, no, Moon Jae-in is the one who wrote these peace right. pillars years ago and he's the one who you know pressed for this and just seeing him going over the dmz and them interacting together but once again there's a lot of controlled elements within south korea you know what i'm saying it's very like our troops are there we have bases there we yeah. do military right. drills that's there. what i mean so how much power does moon jae-in have to really get I mean, something done the, there's obviously a lot of western influence a ton of western influence. Yeah. i mean we've never really t- t- technically ended that war you know, and that was one of the things uh, Kim Jong-un wanted. It's like, you have to say you're ending this war against us. You know what I'm saying? You have to release us. And we, we killed over a million North Koreans in that war. We bombed the shit out of them in the 60s. And um, I don't know, man. We have to, you know, it's one thing to say, let's shake hands. Let's do this. But then lift the fucking sanctions. Yeah. Sanctions are an act of war. Why are we keeping these people in poverty? You know, impoverished. In the Corona-19, we did nothing. Nothing to help them out.